19 participants, but we, we have to start. Um, interesting presentation lined up. Uh, Dr. Guja is presenting uh, on gynecologic care of, uh, of women with breast cancer. A few ground rules. Uh, use your real names, not pseudonyms or phone names uh, when you join Zoom. If you haven't done that, uh, please just leave and rejoin the meeting with the correct name. It helps us to collect uh, your CPT points. Um, anyone who's not hosting or who is not presenting should have their mics muted and their videos off uh, to avoid um, uh, uh, distraction. And uh, for those who want to ask questions, please uh, show by raising your hands or as um, Dr. Guja is presenting, you can actually type on the chat box and uh, we should actually be able to go through this at the end of his uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Grisha, you can take over. Okay, uh, thank you uh, a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Mateke. Um, I'm just going to present on gynecological care of women uh, with breast cancer. And I have absolutely no conflict, uh, no conflict of interest. So I just want to remind everyone that uh, October is the Breast Cancer uh, Awareness Month. And it's, it's important maybe to have this kind of a poster in your rooms just to remind women uh, that mammogramming is more, is, is more important than Insta Instagramming their, their breasts. So this is going to be the outline of my talk. I'll talk a little bit about epidemiology of uh, breast cancer, discuss about BRCA1 and 2 careers, menstrual problems, sexual dysfunction, hormone therapy related issues, osteoporosis, vaginal atrophy, contraception, fertility related issues. So uh, I think everybody on this platform knows that breast cancer is the commonest cancer in women worldwide. And this is data from uh, NCI in the US showing that 29% um, of, of all cancers in women in the United States were, were coming from the breasts. But what, what I found to be a bit more shocking is this statistic that the lifetime probability of developing any one type of cancer in a woman is about one in three. And um, if you look at the same data, what is actually shocking is that for men, it's actually one in two. Uh, so definitely, um, the risk of getting cancer is, is, is rising um, very much. And I think there's been a lot of research happening to see what's the driver of this and how it can sort of like it can be, it can be, it can be reversed if at all, if at all possible. I've got my own theories um, in some theories from published papers, but probably for, for another day. Um, there's a bit of good news showing that if you compare to 1975, it looks like the cancer survival rates are, are getting better. Uh, specifically, if you look at breast cancer, um, it, uh, from 1975 to 77, uh, survival was about five years survival, about 75%, but I think it has increased to about 91% in 2005 to 2011, which is a which is a glimmer of hope. So the, I, I'll just start by talking about uh, hereditary breast ovarian cancer susceptibility syndrome. And I think this was brought to the fore in 2015 when Angelina Jolie was diagnosed with a BRCA1 gene um, mutation and she under, underwent a prophylactic mastectomy and uh, a, a prophylactic uh, risk reducing bilateral salpingophrectomy. So when you're working in your rooms, um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of genetic uh, screening happening in Zimbabwe, uh, but because the borders have been closed, there are some people who have been treated in South Africa who have been tested for, for, for BRCA gene mutation because they've got breast cancer. And these patients might just walk into your rooms. And the common reason why they are referred to gynecologists is because they've got a high risk of developing ovarian cancer. So there's this paper that was published in 2003, it's a bit of an old paper, which was looking at the risk uh, of developing breast and ovarian cancer in women with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. So basically by the age of 70 years, 65% of women would have breast cancer. 
uh, if they've got a BRCA1 mutation and 40% of them uh, will have uh, a diagnosis of ovarian cancer. So if you compare that the, in the average population, the risk of ovarian cancer is about one in 70. 40% is quite astronomical. Uh, the rate of breast cancer is a rate of uh, risk of breast of ovarian cancer is lower in a, in a patient with BRCA2 mutation. It's about, it's about 10%. So basically when these patients come to your rooms, they are usually referred for uh, mitigating the risk of breast cancer. But I think I have to be uh, upfront and say, actually there's no effective screening uh, for, for ovarian cancer. I mean, there was quite a number of studies that, that have been done, starting with the prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian screening study in the USA and the United Kingdom collaborative trial of ovarian cancer screening done in the UK. Uh, basically, these studies, the, they were huge studies which were randomized. The, U, U, uh, U, the USA study, I think it had about 70,000 uh, participants and the UK one had more than 200,000 participants. But so they were looking at, at the benefit of screening women for, for ovarian cancer in the general population. And uh, these two studies actually showed that screening for breast cancer in the general population doesn't reduce uh, mortality, which is basically the end goal of any screening program, and it might actually be associated with harm uh, by operating women because of false positive, false, false positive results. So after, after the disappointment with those two studies, then there was people then tried to look at women with the higher risk, like BRCA gene uh, mutation carriers, or women with a, with a strong family history, basically anyone with a risk of more than 10% of developing ovarian cancer. So there were the biggest studies were the United Kingdom familiar ovarian cancer screening study, which had two phase one and two. So basically those two studies show that is by screening women with a high risk of breast cancer, like the BRCA gene uh, uh, carriers, you might actually diagnose these cancers at an early age, early stage, sorry. And um, you might then increase the chances of having a complete cytoreduction. reduction. So, but they've also didn't demonstrate any benefits in, uh, in reduction in mortality. So as a gynecologist, when you see a patient with a, with a, with a, with a BRCA gene carrier coming to your office, uh, these are the options that you can discuss with them about reducing their risk of ovarian cancer. So there's a study, studies have shown that use, use of combined oral contraceptive pills um, if they don't have a personal history of breast cancer at that point is actually beneficial. It has been shown to reduce the risk of developing uh, ovarian cancer. Then what um, in, in, in uh, tubal ligation has been also shown to reduce the risk of breast cancer, more so in uh, BRCA2 uh, carriers than BRCA1 carriers. And what people have tried to look at, because some of these women are young, and if you do, uh, if you remove their ovaries and fallopian tubes, which is like the recommended way to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer, then they, you, you, you end, up, end up with them having lots of uh, other side effects like uh, vasomotor symptoms, which are then troublesome to manage. Um, so studies have been done looking at whether you, in these patients, because we now know that most like uh, ovarian cancer, especially high grade serous cancer, arise from the fallopian tubes whether you can try and do a subinjectomy so that you, and you preserve their ovaries and then you do a delayed uh, risk reducing bilateral suppling of rectum. But I think studies published to date haven't shown any benefit with that strategy. So basically what these patients we have to offer them is risk reducing bilateral suppling of rectomies once their families have been, have been completed. And in this study, it was shown that, uh, which looked at a meta-analysis of risk reduction estimates uh, with uh, risk, risk reducing bilateral swapping of rectomy showed that it reduces the risk of uh, developing ovarian cancer by about 79%. But I think newer publications have shown that the, the risk reduction can be as high as 96, 96%. So this is probably what you have to discuss when, this, when you offer these patients risk reducing bilateral swapping of rectomy. Laparoscopy is ideal, and this can be done as a day case, and they are discharged warm. And when you do this, don't forget to do washes 
before you proceed and do the uh, bilateral swapping of rectomy. And you must actually specify on your, on your histology form that the pathologist must use the CFIM uh, protocol, which means sectioning and extensively examining the fimbriated end protocol. It has been shown that actually you detect more occult cancers if you use this protocol uh, because it combines histology with thinner sections, one to two millimeters and immunohistochemistry. So I think this is something that you should write down. When you've done this, you might actually re remind the pathologists that they should do the CFIM uh, protocol when they are looking at the fallopian tubes and ovaries. And um, for another day, I think we'll discuss this. Uh, there are cases that have been picked up where you've got positive cytology, but you don't pick up any cancer in the fallopian tubes and ovaries. Um, and uh, you might actually see serous tubal intraepithelial carcinomas or occult cancers. And this, I think patients should be, should be referred for further treatment and, uh, and wake up. Uh, this study pro, uh, done in uh, 2000 by Guzik confirmed that actually after this year, there's an 80% reduction uh, in estradiol and 50% reduction in testosterone. And these patients actually get into surgical uh, menopause. So I would discuss, and one of the biggest problems with surgical menopause is uh, they develop vasomotor symptoms. I'm going to discuss about this in a detail about how then do you manage the surgical menopause uh, in these patients. But however, what you must, when we cancel these patients, we must let them know that to reduce, removing the ovaries and the fallopian tubes drastically reduces the risk of developing ovarian or fallopian tube cancer, but there's still at a risk of getting uh, primary peritoneal carcinomas. Um, all the studies were putting this risk at almost between four and 5%, but I think uh, newer studies have sort of estimated this risk to be between 0 0.8 and 1.0%. And they can also develop primary peritoneal carcinoma years after you have done this procedure, 24, 25 years. So they must still have a long-term follow-up. Uh, it's not the end of the story, but just by reducing, removing their ovaries. In their, in their fallopian tubes. So I think we should kind of like be comfortable in discussing with these patients the risks of ovarian cancer and how they can be mitigated and what are the limitations in following up, uh, in, in limitations even after uh, risk reducing bilateral swapping of rectomies has been done. Then the, the second problem that you, you are most likely to, 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 um, to have patients coming for a consultation could be actually menstrual problems. And uh, we know that actually chemotherapy agents used in, in breast cancer treatment, especially the alkylating agents, result in premature ovarian insufficiency and, uh, or reduced ovarian reserve. And uh, probably I see that there's one oncologist on the platform. In some, in some protocols, uh, the reason could be medical because they use gonadotrophin releasing hormone analogs in their treatment protocols for women with breast cancer. But the commonest reason will be if you have done your risk reducing, uh, they might uh, bilateral swapping of rectomy, then they might come with, uh, with, uh, with surgical menopause. So the, the typical patient sitting in front of you would be around, would be mostly 40 years or older. And the incidence of amenorrhea in these patients is very high, is between 53. And, and 89, uh, between uh, uh, 53 to almost 90 percent. But I think when you are the, the, when you are seeing a patient with these menstrual problems, uh, I think the treatment is more is just mean they mostly they just need reassurance. Within the majority of the women, the menses will resume within a year. But I think it's very important to emphasize that even when the menses re resume, they might still have some menstrual irregularities. So that they might know that, so that they, do, they don't continue phoning or coming coming back. And uh, the use of uh, chemotherapy has actually been this patient has been associated with persistent long term long term poor ovarian reserve, and leading to infertility and premature ovarian dysfunction or, or in, insufficiency. Um, you might get actually a referral from a, from an oncologist uh, saying that they are they are about to start chemo on these patients, and they want you to measure the serum AMH to try and predict whether these patients would have uh, uh, menstrual problems or they will have infertility problems after their treatment for breast cancer. 
Unfortunately, the studies to date have shown that this is not predictive enough and uh, it's not actually standard, standard of care. So the, the bottom line is that these patients with menstrual problems actually just need extensive counseling that most of the time the periods will come back. But if they are over 40 years, then their risk of actually getting into menopause is, mu is much higher and they must be informed as such. And uh, if, they are, if it's, a, it's a young person who's still planning to have a family, it's very, very important to refer them to a reproductive medicine specialist and so that they discuss uh, more options with regards to fertility preservation. I think I'll come back to this uh, uh, towards, towards the end of my talk. So one of the things that most gynecologists, including myself, are not confident about is talking about sex. Um, of course, not when I'm with my friends, but when, I, when, I'm with a, when there's a patient in front of me. So maybe this is just what I've put to remind people that we should be comfortable to talk about sex. I need a gynecologist appointment because I've not had foreplay uh, in a while. So th there are quite a number of reasons why women can actually present to a gynecologist uh, with sexual dysfunction um, when they're on treatment or after treatment for breast cancer. It has been shown that surgery and chemotherapy um, uh, will make uh, uh, result in a, in female, in, in a sort of like women feeling that they've lost their femininity. And especially when they've had mastectomies, they might actually have a perception of that, of body image changes. Uh, they might actually lose their breast sensation after the, the mastectomies. They end up with a reduced desire and they might end up struggling with having orgasms. And also chemotherapy might actually after might induce menopause, resulting in vaginal dryness and resulting in sexual, in sexual pain. Um, so I always joke with my friends that when you're having sex and a woman is crying, don't always assume that you're on top of the game. She might actually be crying because of the pain. So this is more so important if she has been treated for, for breast cancer. And there are some studies showing that actually breast conservation surgery might actually preserve sexual function in, 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 these, um, in these women. So there was a paper published by Barney, which sort of like tried to quantify uh, sort of like the problem of sexual dysfunction in women that are, that are on treatment for, for, for breast cancer. About almost two thirds of these patients who, who come and they've just lost, they don't have any sexual desire. And about 48%, 64% uh, of total absence of sexual desire. And just imagine if you are the husband, um, about 50% of them actually put a low sexual desire. It's there, but it's very, very low. And about 40% of these women who be having severe pain during intercourse, and 45% of them will have frigidity, and 40% will have lubrication problems. So the bottom line is that almost half of patients, or at least half of patients on treatment for breast cancer might present to, us, to, the, to you uh, as a gynecologist with some sexual dysfunction. So what is frigidity? So I thought talking, this picture says it all. If the partner has been trying for 30 minutes and the wife is still saying this, they, that's the definition of uh, frigidity. Absolutely no response to sexual stimulation. So unfortunately, this problem, even for myself, is a very difficult because during my, my years in residency, we didn't sort of like come across uh, a, um, uh, a lot of, not, not that we didn't come across, but it's something that we didn't manage when I was uh, a resident. We, went, so we didn't discuss with women about this problem. So it's always a struggle bringing this discussion to a patient, with a patient. And that's also, I think it's something, it's also a struggle for the patient to bring this problem to the doctor's attention. So it needs a bit of probing. And most of the time, we might not have enough time within uh, or whatever the time that you have set aside for a consultation. And I think one of the things that the, uh, the younger generation of gynecologists should look at is establishing a female sexual health clinic. Uh, when I was doing my fellowship training at Curtis Care, we had this female sexual health clinic and would refer patients there with this sexual dysfunction, not, 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 not just from breast cancer treatment, for, but from, for, from all sorts of reasons. It's um, a consultation that takes about 40 minutes. So it's probably something that needs a lot of time and it's something that we need to look at to see if, whether we can establish this in the, in the public sector. Whether people have got uh, the energy to do it with a salary less than 150, 
something that that is to be seen, but I think something that's really really worth trying. So um, when you see patients with breast cancer, the fourth problem that they are coming to see with you will actually be drug related. So patients who have breast cancer are usually put on uh, SEMS uh, and aromatase inhibitors. So SEMS and selective estrogen receptor modulators and the common drug that we know we use in our settings is tamoxifen. Certainly these two drugs have got a role in the treatment and prevention of uh, estrogen receptor breast cancer. And what we should know is that uh, estrogen receptor breast cancer is not homogeneous throughout the body. Uh, so it's different in the in chemical structure depending on, on the organ. So breast and endometrium, uh, they're not identical. So these drugs, what they do is selectively inhibit or stimulate estrogen receptors of different tissues. And uh, the three drugs that have been uh, sort of like approved by FDA uh, tamoxifen, raloxifen, and stomifen. And uh, studies have shown that, do they work for breast cancer? Definitely they do. Uh, they, they've been shown to decrease, de 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 after using them for five years, decrease the annual risk of breast cancer recurrence by as much as 40%. And actually they've been shown that they reduce mortality by about 34%. And this is independent of the age of the patient, the menopausal status, lymph node status, or chemotherapy use. So they definitely work in patients with endometrial cancer. So as a gynecologist, uh, SEMS and aromatase inhibitors are associated with endometrium and uterine effects. So I'll start with the uh, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen. So their effect actually depends on uh, all the drug that you are, you are specifically using in the menopausal status of the patient. So the commonest complaint that you might or diagnose that you might make in premenopausal women are menstrual irregularities, uh, ovarian cysts, uh, endometrial polyps, and uh, uh, leomyoma growth. Um, and so in premenopausal women, tamoxifen doesn't cause endometrial cancer. So I think that's when they come to, uh, to for a consultation and they are worried, that's one thing that we must sort of like, that must reassure the patients. However, in, in postmenopausal patients, you get completely different set of problems. They end up with endometrial proliferation. They end up with polyps, hyperplasia, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and endometrial cancer. So if we get a patient with, who's postmenopause, uh, who's taking tamoxifen for breast cancer, and they come up with a, come with a persistent discharge, abnormal bleeding, and we should definitely exclude endometrial, endometrial cancer. And um, even in postmenopausal women, uh, tamoxifen use has been shown to increase the risk of developing benign ovarian cysts and also um, leomyoma, leomyomas. So it's, it's essential to, to do ultrasound in, in these patients if they come referred to a gynecologist because they are, they are, they are symptomatic. So I've just put this systematic review which sort of like looked to, to look to summarize the benefits and harms of tamoxifen, raloxifen, tibolone uh, in their use to reduce the risk to reduce the risk of uh, primary cancer. So tamoxifen was was definitely shown to increase the risk of developing uh, endometrial cancer, actually twofold. And uh, this is for, for, uh, for our, 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 our MH students who can get an MCQ where the tam uh, tamoxifen use increases the risk of getting uterine sarcomas. And the answer is true. The risk is low, but it has been documented in literature that they can actually have a slightly increased risk of developing uterine, uterine sarcomas. So oncologists will send patients to us, said, can you please clean these patients? for endometrial cancer because they are on tamoxifen. So what is important to know is that ultrasound scan is associated with a significant false positive rate because of the tamoxifen changes that, that because of the change that tamoxifen induces in the, in the myometrium. So the general take home message is that ultrasound scan has no role in monitor, monitoring asymptomatic patients. You end up doing a lot of unnecessary procedures because of, of a false positive. Um, uh, ultrasound scan finding. So we don't routinely screen women just because they are on tamoxifen. 
But certainly, if a patient is referred because they are symptomatic, then they need to go through the whole evaluation. I think we had a discussion about waking up of a patient with postmenopausal uh, bleeding, I think a couple of weeks back. So if they, they, they come, they are referred and they're on tamoxifen, they're symptomatic, then they have to be worked up to exclude, exclude endometrial cancer. So the other, other drug that we have to be comfortable with are the aromatase inhibitors. So we mostly use tamoxifen in patients that are premenopausal because the, the major source of their estrogen is the, is the ovaries. But once these patients have gone into, into when they are now postmenopausal, uh, the major source of their uh, estrogen is the aromatization of androgens to estrogens uh, in, the, in, the peri, in the peripheral fatty, fatty tissue. So, I mean, it's a discussion that you need to have when a patient is referred to you and probably they are in their 50s, they are menopause, and they're still taking tamoxifen. So it might be worthwhile at that point, moment to have a discussion with them about switching them from tamoxifen to an aromatase, an aromatase inhibitor. Um, so in premenopausal women, aromatase inhibitors, they reduce negative feedback and increase ovarian function. So that's why they are not ideal to use in premenopausal women. And uh, the anastrozole, letrozole, exemestan has been sort of like approved by FDA for use in postmenopausal women. So, so, so once you, these patients have been started on these drugs, they might actually come with these symptoms and we must be ready to, de to deal with them. They might come with uh, vasomotor symptoms. I'll talk about this towards the end. They'll, com they'll come complaining of vaginal dryness. Uh, they will have dyspareunia, cardiovascular symptoms, and sometimes musculoskeletal uh, side effects. And actually, I've just uh, flashed that trial, attack trial, actually, which showed that the risk of fractures in patients on aromatase inhibitors, inhibitors is high, but probably this risk wins off when these patients have been taken off the aromatase inhibitors. So we have to be very comfortable in discussing the side effects uh, of aromatase uh, inhibitors and SAMs. So it has been shown that vasomotor and uterine side effects are better uh, uh, we, we, if a patient is an aromatase inhibitor compared to those that are on antamoxifen. However, on the other hand, the vaginal dryness and dyspareunia are more common than in women that are on tamoxifen. So the last patient that I got to, uh, was a patient with uh, an endometrial polyp who was not keen to, uh, was not keen to have the polyp removed. Endometrial sampling uh, just showed an atrophic uh, endometrium. So we had to switch her from, because she was postmenopausal from tamoxifen to an aromatase inhibitor. So then these problems now come to force. So you have to talk to them about uh, higher problems of vaginal dryness and uh, in dyspare union. And I think just maybe for an MCQ for the, for the, um, for the MS, tamoxifen can also cause venous thromboembolism. So if a patient walks into the rooms, they're on tamoxifen, unilateral leg swelling, so always think about a DVT. And uh, also if you've got an elderly patient coming to you and they are having some visual disturbances, just remember that tamoxifen can also cause some, some cataracts. So the next problem that I, I'm going to discuss that you might face in a patient with breast cancer is osteoporosis from a whole sort of reasons. They might have been osteoporosis because of risk reducing uh, uh, frectomy. It might be chemotherapy that is induced premature ovarian insufficiency, it might be ovarian suppression by gonadotrophin releasing hormone analogs, or it might be aromatase inhibitors. But what is important to note is that 80% of these fractures actually okay in women with a normal mineral density or a patient that with, with osteopenia, but not, uh, not osteoporosis. So these patients might be, must be monitored two yearly or annual clinical assessment uh, of their bone mineral density Using, using DEXA scans. So we should be comfortable in interpreting the results of a DEXA scan and having to discuss with these women about this risk uh, of osteoporosis. So in 2009, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Task Force in the USA uh, recommended treatment when the T-score is less than two or a 10-year major fracture risk is more than 20% or the 10-year hip fracture is probably less than 3%. So, um, don't be worried a lot about this. When the report from, from the DEXA scan, scan comes, 
it has all these the 10 T score, 10 year major fracture, this 10 year deep fracture. So you just have to know when to, to commence treatment. And I think we, we have to talk about some lifestyle changes before we talk about pharmacological treatment of osteoporosis. So these are elderly patients, you must include in, sort of encourage them to have weight bearing exercises, you must encourage them to have muscle strength, strengthening exercises. Uh, so it's, it's not it's not something that's unusual to, uh, or something to uh, recommend that maybe they do some yoga classes. Um, uh, we should sort of like prescribe vitamin D and calcium. If they smoke, we should recommend cessation of smoking, reduce alcohol intake, and um, and come up with some form uh, prevention prevention strategies. Um, and some of the drugs that that have been approved for used in osteoporosis are biphosphonates and raloxifen. So we must be comfortable about discussing, uh, prescribing these drugs. We must also be comfortable about talking the, about the potential side effects of these drugs. Because I mean, because of internet, patients now come because they've got breast cancer. They've been told, they've been told that they've got osteoporosis. They are, they are being referred to you by their oncologist. They've gone on internet and read about all these drugs. And uh, they know a lot. So I mean, we should be very, very comfortable in discussing with patients, commencing this treatment, side effects and, and contraindications. I won't go into this, but uh, some papers have shown that actual biphosphonates might actually be associated with, might have some anti-tumor activity. And um, if you have to prescribe raloxifen, it can also cause vasomotor symptoms and you must be prepared to deal with that problem. I think, I think this is just uh, uh, a repetition. So, so the, I've talked a lot about the problem of uh, vaso motor symptoms. So I, I think the, the basically the, the, the problem is, what do you do with this with this uh, with these patients? Are you going to do we use hormone replacement therapy in patients that have been successfully treated for for breast cancer? So I think the elephant in the room was this paper that was published in 2004, I'm just going to sort of like read to you the conclusion. So this, until September 2003, 434 women were randomized and 345 had at least one follow-up report. After a median follow-up of 2.1 years, 26 women in the HRT and seven in the non-HRT group had a new breast cancer event. All women with an event in the HRT group and, and two of those in the non-HRT group were exposed to HRT and most women get their event when on treatment. So that became a, a major issue. Can, and putting this on top of the uh, uh, um, Million Women Study and World Women Health Initiative Study, the question is, can we use, if a patient has got troublesome vasomotor symptoms, They've been treated for breast cancer. Can we use hormone replacement therapy? So I mean, people then after this study has been published, tried to look at, at this in a bit more in a bit more detail. So there was this paper that was published uh, in uh, 2006 by Batu. They were looking at 15 studies encompassing 1,400 women with breast cancer who were breast cancer survivors. Well, we're using hormone, uh, hormone therapy. So what they actually found was reassuring that compared to non-users, patients actually were using hormone replacement therapy. It had decreased chance of reoccurrence and cancer-related uh, mortality with combined odds ratio of 0 0.5 and 0 0.3% uh, respectively. So what they showed was actually it's safe to use hormone replacement therapy in women with troublesome uh, vasomotor, vasomotor symptoms. And uh, I went back and looked at the South African Menopause uh, Society position statement, where they said that data suggests that hormone therapy may, be, may not be causal, but rather a promoter of pre-existing breast cancer. The absolute risk of breast cancer attributable to hormone therapy is low and falls into the same risk category as several preventable risk factors that are associated with a similar low relative risk of developing breast cancer. These examples are obesity, naliparity, and nevia having breastfed, having a first pregnancy after the age of 37 years, and excessive alcohol intake. 
But however, in their contraindications, they come to something completely uh, opposite to what they were discussing on top. The conclusion was still hormone therapy should not be prescribed in women with a current, past, or suspected uh, risk of, of breast cancer. So I sort of like looked at again at the British Menopause Society, and sort of like they just talk about uh, uh, the flaws with the WHI and uh, Million Women Study. Uh, that key flaws, uh, is, they said, recent critique of the WHI and MWS has clearly illustrated a number of key flaws which limit the ability of the trials to establish a causal association between HRT and breast cancer. But if you go to the end, their recommendations, they also don't recommend the use of, um, of hormone therapy in women with breast cancer. So we can sit the whole day and have a discussion and a debate, uh, but if you look at most guidelines, they don't recommend. So this reminded me about this picture. Uh, we, we could have spent a whole day debating whether Mugabe actually fell or, or it, didn't, it didn't fall. Actually, it's, it's actually like this, a similar debate with whether we can use HRT studies for and studies against, but most guidelines, I think, don't recommend use of HRT uh, in, these, in these patients. So if you cannot use HRT and these patients come to you and they've got troublesome vasomotor symptoms, what are the options? So we can try pharma pharmacotherapy with SSRIs and SNRIs like venlafaxine. Uh, and venlafaxine has been shown to be much, much more effective at lower doses than those ones used for depression, optimum being 75 milligrams, which can uh, 75 milligrams a day, which can be given in two divided or in as a single dose. And um, black coach and soy have been sort of like studied extensively in randomized controlled trials, and they've been shown to have mixed results. Some randomized control studies shown that they work, and others have others have shown that they they are not they are not they're not useful. A lot, of, a lot of work has been done on complementary treatments like acupuncture, relaxation therapies, and actual, also with mixed, mis, mi, mi, mixed results. It was interesting when I was sort of like preparing for this talk that even randomized control trials have been done for relaxation techniques and they've been shown that actually they might be, they might be beneficial. So a patient might come to your rooms expecting to live with a prescription and they end up um, with, with uh, a note where relaxation techniques have been prescribed. And actually there's more and more info, uh, research going on on steroid ganglion blockers, yoga, and hypnosis in the treatment of vasomotor symptoms in women with, uh, with breast cancer. So the take home message is, we, we, the, the results from the studies are quite mixed. But I think the bottom line is the consensus is we shouldn't prescribe uh, HRT in women with a previous history of breast cancer. And we, we should then for as gynecologists be very, very comfortable in discussing the potential other treatments that we can offer uh, uh, women with these troublesome vasomotor symptoms. I'll touch this briefly. Some women will, will come uh, and, their, uh, and their major problem will be vaginal, vaginal atrophy. And uh, the, common, the common presentation, common complaint will be vaginal dryness and, and dyspareunia in 20 to 40% of these patients. Uh, like I've alluded to before, the risk is actually much higher in women that are using aromatase inhibitors compared to those that are using, that are using tamoxifen. And uh, in terms of treatment, we should probably start by offering the non-hormonal treatment like vaginal lubricants and moisturizers. So these are like the first line first line treatment. But smaller studies have evaluated whether you can't use topical estradiol in the form of rings, in the form of cream on suppositories. These studies are very small, but they, they, seem, they, they seem to, to suggest that it might actually be safe to use this, uh, um, uh, to, to use topical uh, estrogen in these patients after treatment for breast cancer. But the bottom line is that the first line treatment should offer them is vaginal lubricants and moisturizers. And before you use um, um, uh, tropical e estrogens, actually they need to, to have extensive counseling. I won't go into this, but actually this other paper published in the New England Journal 
uh, looked at use of a tropical testosterone for low libido and postmenopausal women. We're not, we're not taking estrogen. And some of these patients had, had uh, uh, vaginal atrophy and topical testosterone was shown to relieve uh, uh, vaginal, vaginal atrophy. So the, I'm, I'm, the other reason why you may actually see a patient with breast cancer is if, if they're referred for, for, for contraception. So if you look at the UK, USA, and WHO medical eligibility criteria, hormone contracep hormonal contraception is actually contraindicated. And what is recommended in these patients is actually barrier contraception and an intrauterine contraceptive device. What is interesting, I, I was listening into this presentation from by one of the gynecologists in South Africa, Trudy Smith, a couple of weeks ago, when she was saying, "Can we can we use the Mirena, a Mirena quill in these patients?" So they seem to, she seemed to suggest that actually in this patient with breast cancer, we could use the Mirena quill. So I mean, but if you if you go then and look at the data, especially basically uh, um, based from retrospective studies. Uh, one, the one that I looked at was one from Finland and Germany, which had showed no increase in, in primary breast cancer and thought that this might actually be reassuring. But if you go again, uh, what I would want to recommend everybody is to have the WHO medical eligibility criteria on their phone. Uh, whether you use an Android or use a, an Apple, you can still access it. It still puts uh, Mirena Quill uh, in, category, in category four. So definitely when these patients are referred to us for contraception, I think we should change them from a hormonal contraception to, to a barrier or an, uh, or an, or an IUCD. So some of these patients are young and they, are, they come to you for counseling, they are referred by the oncologist for counseling about future fertility. I think what has been shown that uh, getting pregnant again does not increase the risk of, of breast cancer recurrence so they must actually be reassured that it's safe to, to try and have another baby. The Royal College recommends waiting for two years after completing treatment, mostly to make sure that you don't want somebody to get pregnant when they've got a recurrence. So I want to give them two years to make sure that they've been treated and at, at that point before they try to have a baby, they don't have a, don't have a recurrence. Because, because of the physiological changes that happen to the breast, if they happen to have a recurrence, it might actually be difficult to detect. And by the time you detect it, the disease might actually be advanced. But I think the, we should be very clear to these patients that if they've been treated for breast cancer and their risk of premature ovarian insufficiency is high. Um, and what I found also very interesting is there are studies that have been done to, to look at young women before they commence chemotherapy to try and put them on gonadotrophin releasing hormone analogs to try so that you, you make their, their oocytes inactive. And because they are not sort of like developing during the time that on chemotherapy, uh, you, the, the sort of like the, the theory is then in, you could be able to reserve their ovarian, ovarian functions. But I think the, study, the outcome for most of those studies have, have not been encouraging. And uh, this is not yet um, a standard of care. At the beginning, I, I spoke about referring these patients to a reproductive medicine specialist before they, they commence treatment for, for breast cancer. And uh, they have to discuss about if they get into premature ovarian insufficiency, about IVF, uh, and if they want to use their, their own eggs, so they might discuss about oocyte cryopreservation. And what is a bit more interesting is now uh, cryopreservation of actual ovarian, ovarian tissue. But at the bottom line, in Zimbabwe, we've got very, very limited resources. And uh, it's not just Zimbabwe, even in the public sector in South Africa, this sort of like uh, some of these things are not, uh, are not available. And I think uh, we should not forget about other simple things that we can offer these patients like, uh, like adoption. So in conclusion, I want to say that a gynecologist plays a very significant role uh, in the health of women with breast cancer, and we get lots and lots of referrals uh, from, from, from oncologists to try and address different uh, problems that the women will be uh, encountering during their treatment. 
We should be very comfortable in discussing the risk of ovarian cancer in women with hereditary breasts and ovarian cancer susceptibility syndrome, BRCA1 and BRCA2. We should be very, very confident uh, in sort of like in discussing this with these patients about how we mitigate the risk. I think we talked about the uh, combined oral contraceptives. We, 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 and we spoke about a bit about that there's no much evidence for tubal ligation or subinjectome while they are waiting for a delayed um, uh, procedure. But I think the definitive way to reduce their risk is a uh, um, risk reduction bilateral sarcopingophrectomy, ideally done laparoscopically. And these patients get into surgical menopause. And then after that, we should be very, very comfortable in discussing with them about how then we deal with menopause-related complications like uh, the vasomotor symptoms. We should be very, very comfortable in, in uh, we should be very knowledgeable about um, SEMS and aromatase inhibitor, uh, when to use a tamoxifen, when to switch a, to a patient to a aromatase inhibitor, the potential side effects uh, of, of this treatment, and certainly how do, we, whether, how do we monitor or evaluate a patient on tamoxifen who presents with postmenopausal bleeding. We should be very comfortable in discussing uh, management of osteoporosis uh, and interpreting the screening results from, from their disc, DEXA scans. We should be comfortable in discussing with this patient about vaginal atrophy, uh, contraception, and, uh, and their fertility issues. One thing that I left out there was we talked about sexual dysfunction. I think even myself at this moment, I'm not very comfortable in discussing that. I'm trying to work on that. I'm still working in progress, but I think it's something that I encourage everybody to try. Uh, this can be done, but it takes a lot of time and uh, a lot of commitment. And uh, whenever you see a patient with breast cancer, even myself, my cell phone is always in standby for a quick consult because they, there's always somebody who knows more than, more than yourself. I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much for taking your time to listen. Um, thank you very, very much, Dr. Guja. Uh, quite a very interesting uh, presentation. I'll go through uh, uh, the questions um, or comments that came through our chat. Uh, you can still feel free to continue sending your messages on chat. Otherwise, if you want to ask questions, you can just show by raising your hands. Uh, Dr. Machagaire did comment or gave a question earlier. Uh, the slides on cancer risks and cancer trends does not include cancer of the cervix. Was this intentional? No, I mean, it was intentional, but this is data from the, from the USA and uh, uh, um, cervical cancer is, is, um, is no, it doesn't feature in the top 10 uh, cancers in women in, in the USA. But I mean, if you, if you then go and look at the actual data, you can actually look even at the risk of cervical cancer, just American data in cervical cancer is not very common in their in their setting compared uh, to to us this side of in this part of the world. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope Dr. Manchakere, you've been answered. If you uh, still want to comment about that, you can uh, just show by raising your hands or send another message. Uh, Dr. Mazire says the breast should uh, come back to us. Uh, we should wrestle the general surgeons. Maybe Dr. Guja, having had uh, a great experience uh, in Cape Town, you can tell us about this war between uh, general surgeons and gynecologists over the female breast. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, um, I mean, I think there are different practices across the world. So in some countries, I mean, the breast cancer is managed by, by, by gynecologists. And in, in, in some countries, it's managed by, uh, by uh, uh, general, general, general surgeons. But I mean, one thing that really disappoints me with, uh, with management of breast cancer is you obviously see a young woman who has had bilateral uh, breast cancers with a very strong family history suggestive that they might actually be a, a, having one of these gene mutations and absolutely no referral has been done for, 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 for genetic, genetic screening. So I really feel that um, it leaves a lot to, to be desired. So I'm also sure whether as a society, we are prepared for the fight. 
But my suggestion would be a mid of the road kind of approach would be to incorporate MDT um, as part of treatment with, with, in women with breast cancer. So probably an ecologist, we should sort of like, as a society, push for the inclusion of uh, gynecologists in the discussion. For, first of all, introduction of MDTs, they are probably happening, but sort of like the invitation and inclusion of gynecologists in the discussion of uh, patients with breast cancer. Whether I want to take to have the full, I'm, I'm not, I'll leave that to, to Dr. Matereke as, as, the, as the boss. But in Cape Town, I think they just use the same practice in the UK. Uh, breast cancer is managed by, uh, by, um, by, by, by surgeons. Uh, and uh, we actually, ref we, they're, they're usually referred when they've got uh, gynae related complications and for counseling for mitigation of uh, endometrial cancer. Thank you for, for the response. Uh, Uncle Mike, you raised your hand. You can uh, unmute yourself and make a comment or contribution. Professor Chirenje. Hi, uh, thanks both of you for that uh, very nice presentation. I just want to just make a comment on this so-called fight between gynecologists and um, uh, general surgeons. It really uh, can never be a fight. Um, I think what you have to realize is the more advanced the country is, the more they have moved away from um, um, self-discipline, self-initiated screening and treatment without uh, a team. So certainly in the US and UK, even uh, during my time in on oncology training, there were already people in Sheffield, general surgeons who were subspecializing in uh, breast cancer. So what you, what you really find, what my emphasis here is, I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's a requirement for most countries in most syllabi for, to, to really have aggressive teaching for breast disease during a gynecological training. That's just, a, you know, it should just be a must. It's not like a, because the pit of it is that when you look at a woman uh, who's perimenopause and you don't know the screening algorithm for breast cancer, and you're a gynecologist, it's actually considered substandard care in other countries. Uh, you will know, I mean, if some of you may know um, um, uh, a graduate from here actually, he's, he's got a huge breast screening clinic in DC, um, uh, Dr. Masa, Musara. And you find it's, it's, it's really the standard even in the UK where people will, it's just a huge burden of disease that there is no sense in every general surgeon doing um, uh, uh, breast lumpectomies and axillary node dissection. And, uh, and you ask them, what's your reference for chemo red? It's, uh, I'm sure both of you have gone into that where the reference point, there is no protocol, standard protocol uh, I'm aware of in Zim. Everybody does their own, you know, the hair screening, the receptor. And, and so, so my point is that I think as a society, we should, uh, Residence. Uh, so, I don't have any Hello, hello, I'm done. Sorry. Ah, okay. Oh, okay, thank you. I think we have some, some, some problems with that. I think, um, I don't know if everyone managed to get your, your, your the last part of your comment. If you can go, uh, just repeat it. No, I was just saying, I think it would be quite healthy instead of creating fights to actually encourage us as a teaching unit to comprehensively teach about breast screening and the algorithm for screening and both treatment so that uh, any practicing gynecologist is really has the comfort. I mean, not all of us have gone through training in with a good surgeons for that matter. Certainly my, my boss was, uh, uh, took me through uh, 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 breast uh, uh, excisions and extra node dissections well, but not everybody would have gone through that. So I'm saying uh, we should put it in as part of our training for our residents. That's the point I was trying to emphasize. You will find in fact, if you do that, there are no such things as fights because uh, Bismarck, if you diagnose one uh, yourself among your patients, you 
board is interested to know what's level of care. Any surgeon will tell you that they are good at breast disease, they are good at colorectal, they're good at stomach, they're good at anything. You know, they're just good at everything. So I'm just be aware of that in most, most part of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for drilling uh, home that point, um, Dr. Nyakura. Um, Big Falls, thank you, Dr. Guja, for a simulating presentation. Dr. Manyame, great talk, Guja. How do I counsel and monitor the daughters of those women who are BRCA1 positive and have received treatment? Okay, uh, so I, if, I, if I'm getting the question is, uh, so the, the daughter, uh, first of all, so when you, when you see a patient like this, what must happen is a patient walks into the clinic uh, and what you must then do is to sort of like do a family pedigree. And uh, then when you have done a family pedigree, then there, are some, uh, uh, then there are some tools available, some of them online to try and then sort of like estimate uh, the risk of, uh, of the likelihood of a patient having, having a, a mutation. And uh, if this risk exceeds more than 10%, then this, then, then the, the, the index patient is then screened. And uh, if this index patient is screened and they are found to have a BRCA1 or a, a gene mutation, and then uh, because you already have the family, family pedigree, so then you have to discuss with the daughters uh, and other relatives about, about being screened. So what I found interesting, what I don't want to go into today is if you screen them, uh, and you don't, they don't have a BRCA gene mutation. So to simplify it, then sort of like then they put an average risk. But what we have to be aware of at the back of our mind is that I think we've not been able to elucidate all the possible uh, uh, genetic mutations associated with the, this, uh, this syndrome. So the, 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 what has been topical, if you read literature is, if you screen them and they are negative, should they be looked after like someone who's BRCA1 or BRCA, uh, would actually don't have, don't have the mutation. So if, if they have the mutation, then I think the issue is then they need to have a multidisciplinary team management. They need to have um, breast mammography and MRIs starting from the age of about 20 to uh, 25. And this must be done, must be done annually. So they must be managed within the context of an MDG team. And there's certainly a role for risk reducing uh, mast mastectomies. And there are a lot of, if you, if you read the literature, there are more and more of these surgical techniques being described. And some of them actually are nipple preservation because some of the things, women are not comfortable losing their nipples. And so can actually have some of these surgical way you preserve, although there's a, a, a lot of debate whether then preserving that area around the nipple uh, uh, doesn't leave them with a slightly increased risk of getting breast cancer. Then for, for gynae, then these patients definitely should be followed up. And although the studies that I've mentioned have shown a reduction in mortality, uh, if, they are not, if they don't have a personal history of breast cancer, we should actually offer, uh, give them chemo prevention with combined oral contraceptives. And we then should then follow them annually uh, with a transvaginal ultrasound scan and a, and a CA-125. But I think the, the bottom line is the take-home message when we talk to these patients is after the age of uh, 35 or 40, once the family has been completed, they must have a risk re reduction uh, bilateral sobbing of rectum. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Guja. A suggestion, uh, one of the participants said it would be great to consider another presentation on breast cancer. I mean, this is, this is how it is really excited uh, uh, your listeners. Uh, so I, I, total, I, do, I total agree with Uncle Mike's sentiments and I totally agree with the, um, with the, with, with, um, uh, with the last comment. You, you sh as a gynecologist, you must be comfortable in, because this patient, so after surgery for, it's not everybody who, gets, who needs a mastectomy. Some of these patients that's just need a wild, wide local excision mm. for females. And after surgery for, for breast cancer, these patients, depending on their hormonal status, the ERPR, uh, the HER2, they are then triaged. So like it's now more, more like personalized treatment. Uh, and 
you then try it and then determine what is their best treatment modalities. So some patients will just be given uh, hormone treatment. Some patients will need uh, chemotherapy. And so, I mean, I think I totally agree with that. I think it would be very, very interesting to have that kind of, uh, kind, kind of a discussion so that every gynecologist is, is comfortable uh, in whatever in, because then what the problem then becomes, a patient becomes more knowledgeable than you. She's coming to you and said, I just said, uh, why local excision? That's a, that and has happened. I was put on, <laughs> and I was put on, I was, then I was like, why didn't they take out the breast, you see? So I think you need to at least to be on the same page with these patients, but certainly to have more knowledge. So I think the, for the residents, I think it's not an unfair question then to get a patient with breast as part of your exams. So that, uh, so just take more time to read and know more about treatment for breast cancer. So, Kusha, the request was for you to speak on breast cancer management in pregnancy, role of chemotherapy, surgery, etc. I mean, at a, at, at a I mean, next meeting, and more importantly, fertility and breast cancer. This was just a suggestion, so maybe you can uh, uh, consider um, giving us a, a surprise presentation at some point in the future. And uh, yeah, we have had our fair share of uh, knowledgeable patients. Um, I mean, in our practices, it's always a challenge when that happens. Um, I think um, it's, um, I don't see any other raised hands. Uh, if there's anyone who has got a burning issue to, to ask or comment about the presentation, just unmute yourself and say something or send a message. Uh, hi, Dr. Mativeki. I want to congratulate Ms. George with speaking on fantastic presentation. I think it was long overdue and we really need more on this topic. Actually, if we could have it monthly, I would be happier. My question is, next door neighbor South Africa, uh, Mill Park Hospital, Carol Benz Center for the, for the management of, of these patients with the breast, uh, BRCA, with BRCA positive mutations. And on the team, there is a breast surgeon, um, there is a guy on the team, psychologist, and um, plastic reconstructive surgeon. We have all these specialities in the country. How far are we from um, doing something like that. Why can't we have a center like that? And we also have a, a skills to do laparoscopic bilateral salpingophorectomy. Yeah. Uh, so what I is Dr. George's opinion? I, I totally agree with you, George, 100% that our treatment for any woman with cancer should be within the context of a, of a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, I think the, the, I mean, the elephant in the room is that no matter how enthusiastic you are, because I mean, this must start in the public sector so that every trainee finishes and they are aware that treatment of cancer should be done within a multidisciplinary team uh, context. But the, the public hospitals are, are, are not working that. That's, I mean, that's a big shame. Um, I think uh, Dr. Mkucha is, we are, we are writing a, a case report with Dr. Manasse about a, about a patient who had uh, colon cancer at the age of 41. I think he had daughter with a colon, colon cancer at the age of 30, I think 35. And the patient's mother had colon cancer as well. It was actually quite screaming that this patient has got Lynch syndrome. She wasn't, she wasn't managed within the context of a multidisciplinary team. She never was offered an opportunity for risk reducing uh, um, hysterectomy and, and bilateral swapping of rectomy. 15 years down the, late, down, down the line, she presented then with, with, uh, with endometrial cancer, which was potentially uh, preventable. So I agree with you that uh, definitely there's need for MDT whenever you're managing a patient with cancer. At this moment, I came with a lot of enthusiasm to try and make things happen in public, but it's just not, it's not, it's just not working. So probably what we have to do is uh, see whether we can start to assemble teams and start to do it a little bit in private. Uh, certainly in private, uh, I mean, this has to be within the context of an MDT, but my wish and my hope would have been to, to have these things done in the public hospitals so that every trainee and every uh, uh, leaves the unit knowing that cancer, whether it's breast, endometrial, what type of cancer is managed within the context of an MDT. I totally agree with your sentiments. 
I think the issue is that the elephant in the room is that the public sector is not is not working as it's supposed to to work. Thank you, Dr. Goja. Thank you, Dr. Dr. George. Um, thank you for the great comments. I think we've gone way past past the time. Um, another it's meeting. Fine. So uh, for those who still want to uh, make suggestions and comments, uh, please just uh, direct your comments directly to uh, Dr. Guja or to our secretary, whom I really want to thank for organizing these meetings. Uh, Veronica, I believe, is slowly becoming a gynecologist, and uh, she's done extremely very well in organizing these, uh, these meetings. Unfortunately, we do have another a meeting uh, as the executive leadership uh, that was supposed to start about 10 minutes ago. Uh, so I will probably have to um, uh, call, call the meeting off, ask uh, the executive leadership to remain behind so that we do continue uh, with our discussions because unfortunately we won't be able to go past uh, 6 p.m. So thank you very much, Dr. Guja, for an exciting presentation. We are still waiting for a surprise presentation on breast cancer and pregnancy. And um, I will uh, kindly ask the executive leadership to remain behind so that we have our deliberations. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to present. Good night to everyone.